welcome back to the Tax Advisor and Biz Coach Success Podcast. The purpose of these episodes is to help entrepreneurs become more successful, avoid tax and other business headaches. Remember to tune in frequently as we will be sharing tips, secrets, and expert recommendations in how you can manage your finances, improve wealth, and grow your business. Please like, share, and subscribe. Here's your host, Liz Soria. Hello, folks. It's Liz Soria, your host of the Tax Advisor Business Coach Success Podcast. And I am um, really thrilled today. And as you might notice, I'm excited because anytime I bring valuable guests to my show, it really special for me and hopefully it is for all of you. And the reason behind it is because we're all here to learn from each other. And I always say this, and I think it's so important that, you know, we can give a helping hand with things that we have acquired through our lifetime, which is experience and, um, you know, skills. So today I have an incredible guest with me uh, by the name of Stephen Mays. And he, we're going to discuss the topic about leadership tips and habits, especially habits. Don't we know that a lot of us, we need to change our habits, right? So daily things that we are so used to over and over doing it. Um, and we're going to talk about his amazing book. It's called The Power Three. So I'm going to leave that up to Stephen. So Stephen, um, please move forward and uh, let know the audience a little bit about your background, which is incredible because I know you come from a military background and uh, actually Air Force, which is one of my favorites. So uh, if you can kindly share with the audience a little bit about your background um, and what really kind of brings you, you know, to be the, the, the great guest uh, to discuss a topic so profound as leadership. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. Um, my background started out because uh, I was actually an Air Force brat. My father was in the Air Force uh, as an enlisted man for uh, over 20 years. And I spent uh, a large part of my life traveling all over the United States and portions of the world following my father to whatever bases he went to. So those of us who were, had parents that were in the military are referred to as brats. And I'm, I'm proud to be a brat. Okay. Um, after... Uh, uh, I graduated from high school. I went to the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and uh, spent four years there, majored in mathematics, uh, and then went into the uh, submarine force. So I became a nuclear engineer and uh, made uh, several deployments on the uh, USS Los Angeles, where I earned my gold dolphins, uh, to the Mediterranean, to the North Atlantic, to the Pacific, to the Panama Canal, uh, stationed in Pearl Harbor, Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia, all kinds of different places that I went to during that period of time. Uh, after my Navy service, I went to uh, work in consulting um, and then later went to work for the federal government uh, in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And then when I left the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, went back into consulting again and did that for another 10 or 15 years before I become semi-retired. Now, the reason I wrote the book was because some of my friends said, you know, Steve, you want to write a book. And because we would talk about things all the time, uh, especially about leadership. And so I finally sat down and wrote a book because I found that uh, there were many things that I learned along the way that I learned through the College of Hard Knocks, the hard way. And I thought, well, why didn't somebody teach me this sometime along the way? So why didn't somebody let me know this was the way that it was? Um, and so that's the reason I wrote the book is to try to help people understand what leadership is. And I came through some really interesting discoveries about leadership by having both really good leaders, both in the military and civilian world, and having some really poor leaders in both the military and civilian world. So I was able to compare what good leaders did and what bad leaders did. And so those things began to fit together to form a picture for me of, uh, what it is. And that's the pictures I have in the, in the book, I call it the power of three leadership paradigm. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is the picture of it uh, in the book. Uh, but, uh, but basically, I decided to look at leadership from a little bit different angle than what I'd seen in most books and things. Most people talk about leadership in styles. Like, what kind of style of leadership are you? You are a servant leader. You're an autocratic leader. You're a participatory leader. You're a democratic leader. You're a, all kinds of different styles. And then I thought, well, did George Patton have anything in common with Mahatma Gandhi? Did Winston Churchill have anything in common with Nelson Mandela? 
Did Douglas MacArthur have anything in common with Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, all those people are great leaders. Yeah, but sure. They have completely different personalities and completely different styles of interaction with people. So I came to the conclusion that it can't be about style. It's got to be about something else. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I started looking to see what it was that, that all the great leaders do. What are the things that they do? And could I put together a model to do that? And that's what I came up with in the Power Three. And explain that to the audience that would they know the power three, because like I said, I know the three words and I don't want to say, I want to allow you to say them uh, because I think they were very selective. You must have really selected them, them very well and they have profound meaning and maybe we can touch a little bit in each one of them, uh, why you decided these were really um, strong words to use on your book um, and to, again, like you said, it's about sharing your knowledge and your experience and I, i'm with you in the same boat i i wish that a lot of things i have learned before you know a uh, long time ago even before i started my business and you know the reality is that sometimes uh, we don't have that perfect book we just can pick up and buy and it's going to answer all our questions but we pick up golden nuggets from each person because as we go through life we do acquire experience, right? That's what gives us wisdom. So go ahead and let's go back and discuss about the power of three. What are those magic three words, Stephen? <laughs> well, everything in my book is grouped together in, in the group numbers of threes. I have a special special relationship with the number Why? three. Why? Uh, you want to know? <laughs> uh, in, part, in part because I have three 22-year-olds in my household, so... Oh, what a blessing! Oh my goodness, that's beautiful. So, uh, when when you're surrounded when you're surrounded by things like that, you start noticing things in threes. <laughs> but the the, uh, the power three leadership uh, paradigm involves uh, three things, and to be a leader, you have to you have to exist in these three planes of existence. And the first one is a foundation: no house, no building, no structure, no plan, no idea ever gets formulated without a foundation. And if it doesn't have a good foundation, it won't last very long. I agree. So you have to have a foundation for your leadership, and that's the first and most important part. And the next thing is, once you get into the practice of being a leader, um, you're going to have challenges come along that are going to make it difficult to move forward. And those challenges, when I looked at them, the challenges I faced and the challenges I observed, all fell into one of three little convenient categories. And so I had... I think maybe I'm onto something here. And then once you learn how to deal with the challenges, then you really get to do the ultimate thing, which is what leaders do. And what leaders do is in the area of achievement. And for that area, I came up with an acronym. You know, you're in your military, everything has an abbreviation or an acronym. Okay. So uh, nobody, nobody ever has, says commander in chief, uh, chief uh, the Pacific fleet, they say sink land fleet. So, oh. So okay. there's always abbreviations in the Navy, so I, I have that habit. So an acronym that I use for the achievement phase is AID, A-I-D. And that's because the three things that are involved with achievement are assist, inspire, and depend. So that's what leaders do. They help others, they inspire others, and they depend on them to do things. So that's the, 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 the pieces of that, and each one of these levels has... Uh, more information and more details we can talk about. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt there for a second, Stephen, but teamwork. I, I think that no one has truly, um, that I can recall in history, uh, become completely successful on their own. Uh, when we form teams and we get supports from others, um, we mastermind. And then we're able to become very powerful because as, as, as good as one brain can be, it's not enough. Well, it's, it's, it's several things associated with that. That's why depend is such an important part of the achievement. Um, leadership is about influencing others to be able to do more than they could do on their own yeah. and to be able to do more than you could do on your own. If, if you could do everything, you wouldn't need followers. You could just do it. Right. But in reality, if you want to accomplish anything of worthwhile and big, you almost always have to have other people involved. And leadership is the way you get other people involved and moving towards accomplishment. And so that's why when you use the word teamwork, that's, that's uh, an assumption on my part. I didn't even use the word teamwork in my book because I was looking at the thing that it was already a given. You have to have leaders and you have to have followers, and that's a team. So 
that's uh, kind of where I came from with that. And uh, that's why you, you caught, caught on very quickly to that thing in the achievement category of depending, because if you could do it all yourself, why would you need to depend on anybody? You wouldn't. Right, right. And it's a, it's a really critical part of leadership because um, I'll skip ahead a little bit and tell you something about that particular area. If you could do it all yourself, they wouldn't need anybody else. But you do have to have other people. One of the hardest things a leader has to learn is that when things go well, you get the credit, even if you're not the one who's doing all the work. True. So you get the credit when you don't deserve it all. The other thing is when things go to hell, you get the blame, whether you deserve it or not. So you get the good and the bad. That's what I always right. say. And if, you're not, <laughs> and if you're not willing as a leader to accept both the credit you may not deserve it all and the blame when you don't necessarily deserve it all, if you're not willing to accept that, you're not ready to be a leader. You need to go do something else for your career because you're not ready to be a leader. Um, so that's why depend is so important. And most people who are so afraid of being failure they're so afraid of risk and so afraid of failure, will try to control everything. And so micromanagers, which is a huge problem in industry and in the military and every place else, they do that because they're, they know they have to depend on other people, but they don't want to leave it to chance, so they try to control it all. Yes. And that's a, res, that's a recipe for failure. See, it's absolutely I, recipe. I have to interrupt you again. I mean, micromanaging, that is such an you know, incredible word. And I, I have noticed this also. You're absolutely right in, 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 you know, in what we call in the corporate world, where it, you know, even certain key employees, others want to control them. Um, and I'm like, it just blows my mind. Why so much micromanaging? Is this a control issue that just humanity has? Yeah, that I, if I'm hiring a title, I think I need to control you every step? I, I, you know? It, it's, a, it's a fear of failure is what it really is. It amounts to fear of failure. You don't want to be blamed, so you try to control. And we had a saying in the Navy that was very profound, and uh, I think if more people adopted it, we'd be better off, and that is, you can delegate authority, but you can't delegate responsibility. Wow. So many people in other positions in the world want to delegate the responsibility to somebody else, and they want to keep all the authority to themselves. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do to depend. When you depend, you give them the authority to do what's needed, and you rely on them to do that. You accept responsibility, but you give them authority. The more you do that, the better your team will perform and the more you will achieve. That's why that depend piece of the AID is so terribly important yeah. because it's hard for humans to say, I'm going to be held responsible for something and I've got 15 people working on it. And if any one of them messes it up, I'm going to get blamed. Fault. It's my fault. Yeah, my fault. My fault. And, and if you can't accept that, as a, then you have no business being a leader. You, you're not because you won't, you won't just you will, you will have some hair, and it, and it happens all the time. So, and, and there was two, three words that I, I did want to kind of touch base with, with you um, as we have you in the show. And, and again, thank you for being with us because, um, you know, um, I always been very um, uh, strong about the foundation, and that's word that you brought up. And, and it is also in, in, my, in my industry what I do, you know, uh, as an entrepreneur myself, which is accounting, you don't have a foundation. I call it it's like almost like an, like an engineer. If you don't have a structure of the floor of a house, how can you build on top of it? How can you build walls and windows and a roof? It's impossible. You cannot put the door. You can put obviously the furniture inside. You have to have a foundation in everything in life. And um, one of the things that you mentioned in, in the power three of the book was foundation, challenge, and achievement. Mm -hmm. Um, and how connected those three words really are. Do you want to touch base a little bit on that? Would that be okay, Stephen? Sure. Um, the, the, the foundation, I think, is really critically important. And in my paradigm, there are three parts of the foundation. The foundation has three parts. Honesty, courage, and talent. And let me explain what I mean by each of those, because it's not necessarily what you might think right off the, uh, at first blush. Okay. Honesty is the ability to see yourself and the world you're in the way that it is. Not the way you want it to be, not the way that it could be, not the way that it should be, 
but the way that it is. It is. Now, that's really important because um, I, I like to think of it as a map. When you're uh, Scott Peck, who wrote the book, A Road Less Traveled, I don't know if you've read that or not, but it's a oh, terrific yeah. book. Is it? Uh, uh, he talks about everybody has a map. And it consists of all your experiences and all the people you know and all the situations you've been in in your life. You create a map to allow you to navigate through life. And as you go, you get more information and your map grows and changes. So that's seeing it the way that it is. But the way I see it has different pieces than the way you see it because you've had a different experience. So if you want to be able to function, then those people have to have some similarities between their maps. You have to be on what's quote, quote unquote, called the same page. So you have to be able to be honest, see things the way they are. That's for you and for them. For example, if you're in New York and you want to go to Chicago, you head west. But if you have somebody in New Orleans in your company and you want them to go to Chicago and you say, we need to go to Chicago, go west, they're going to end up in Phoenix. True. It's a good fact. And if you have somebody in San Francisco, they're going to end up wet. Yeah. So you have to have the map. And honesty is about getting yourself and your map and the people you're working with together so you see things the way they are because if you don't know where you are, you can't get to where you want to be because you don't know where it is. So that's why it's really, really important for honesty. Courage, I define as three things. You overcome fear to do something for somebody else without regard to how much it's going to cost you. Wow. So that's, that's the definition of fear. So, and it's interesting because people exhibit courage all the time, but we don't often notice it and we don't pay much attention to it. But it really does happen way more than you think. It does. The, it last, does agree. the last piece is talent. And this is about knowledge, skills, and perseverance. You have to know how to do something. Then you have to be good at it. And then you have to persevere and work it to get your skill honed to where it becomes something that's second nature and you can just do it every time no matter what. You have to master so, it. That's what I call yes. mastering something. Become an expert really in something that you have passion or call it, you know, love into, you know, anything that you do in life. Just become a master of it because when you become really good it comes like natural you don't even have to work it it's just there it's already invaded in your body and your brain so i, I love that part that's well the, the example i used in the, the example i used in the book is that uh, uh michael jordan who's arguably the best basketball player of all time when he was a freshman in high school he got cut from the varsity he had to play one year in the junior varsity they didn't play him on the varsity now it wasn't because he wasn't skillful it wasn't because he didn't know how to play basketball. It's because he needed to hone and work and improve his game. And then after that, no one ever cut Michael Jordan from any team ever again <laughs> from basketball. So that's the case of uh, a situation. like Most people don't realize that Michael Jordan actually got cut from his first basketball team in high school. So he played on the junior varsity instead of the varsity that first year. Um, but here's the, here's the dirty little secret about the foundation that most people don't realize. We want to hear the it. The dirty on, little Steven. secret is – that of those three things, honesty, courage, and talent, right. talent is the least important. Is that right? Yes. Now, I'll, give you, I'll explain to you why. Because catastrophic failures of leadership almost never occur due to a lack of talent. If you ask yourself this question, I've done it myself and I've asked other people, think of the biggest failure you've ever had in your life. I don't care whether it's professional, personal, or whatever. Was the biggest failure in your life because you lacked talent? You know? Or maybe it was it someplace else? And I give three examples in the book. Uh, I talk about Richard Nixon was the president of the United States and the only president to ever resign because he was about to get impeached. Now, the question I asked was, was, did Richard Nixon have to resign because he lacked talent? No. Okay. Bill Clinton uh, lost his law license to practice law because he lied in a deposition in a court case. He ended up paying a huge settlement to settle the court case out of, out of court. And as a result of that scandal, the, the House and the Senate went from Democrat to Republican for the first time in 50 years. Now, did that happen to Bill Clinton because he lacked talent? Mm -hmm. no. 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 Well, a guy who graduated in 1974 from the United States Military Academy in West Point, a contemporary of mine, was widely considered to be by everybody in the uh, military to be the greatest strategic and tactical leader 
of our age. They were likened him to uh, Eisenhower and MacArthur. His name was David Petraeus. He was the head of the CIA. Wow. Keeper of the nation's secrets. He had a secret. He was having an affair with his biographer. It got been made public. He had to resign. He had to deal with his family falling apart. He had to do all these things. Now, was the greatest tactical and strategic leader in the United States military history of this era? Did he have that failure because he lacked talent? No. No, but it was not because of talent. Very good point. I like that. So here's, here's, here's the even more important point. Now, if you went to college, you had a major that you were, you had for your, for your, what would, what did you, what was your major in college? It was accounting. Yeah. So I have okay, a, so you had, a BBA and then my majors in accounting. Yes. Okay. So you had a, you had, you, you accounting. So I know you took, uh, you, you took math courses, right? you took uh, accounting courses. And if I asked you any of the courses that you took, you could probably tell me what grade you got in your accounting course, couldn't you? Yeah, more or less. But you know what's interesting, and, and I share this with everyone, is that uh, not even one third of the things that I learned <laughs> in the university, uh, I really have put in practice. I really have it. I mean, I, 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 for me, it was just, again, the foundation of having mm -hmm. a career. What I have acquired afterwards is what has made a difference in my life. Yes. And, and but let I me ask you this question. People. Let me ask you this question. So you can recall what grades you got in accounting. You probably took a, an English composition course as a requirement. You can probably tell me what grade you got in that course. Now, let me ask you this question. What grade did you get on your capstone project in courage class? Goodness, I can't even remember. <laughs> no, you didn't take a courage class. So what did you get in your final exam in your honesty class? Uh, no, I didn't get an exam for that neither. Right. So the question <laughs> I'm having is this. We spend 99.9% .9 of our time working on our foundation in the talent area and not in the honesty and the courage area. So if all three of those pillars for your foundation aren't strong, eventually one of them is going to collapse. And the one that's most likely to collapse is the one you spend the least amount of time developing. Very interesting. So that's why the foundation is so important because you have to understand that if you're going to have work on the honesty portion, you're going to work on the courage portion, you're going to have to do that yourself because there's no courses, there's no there's no instruction, there's no manuals, there's no anything out there except trial and error experience to teach you those things, and you have to pay attention to them because no one else is looking at them. When you put a resume put to go uh, get an application for a company, there's no place on there that says, how honest are you? There's no place on there that says, how brave are you? That, the only thing we want to know is, like what them. school did you go to? What was your GPA? Hey, Stephen, <laughs> that's a good idea. I think we just came up with something bright. We, maybe we should be starting to tell HR managers to start putting that in the job application. <laughs> well, my point is, my point is, if, you, if you're going to be a leader, or actually if you're going to be a good follower, that's also true, uh, being able to be honest, to see things the way they are, and be able to be courageous, which is to do things for other people, in spite of the fear and without regard to the cost it will have for you, those things are equally important as talent. And if you fail, I bet you failures that you're going to find in your life. I can't find any major failures in my life that were because I lacked talent. I really can't. I, I may not have had all the experience in the world, but that wasn't my problem. Usually it was because I wasn't seeing things the way they really were. And that was the honesty part that I think is so critical. And it's, hard to do because you get caught up in things you get emotional you start feeling things the way things should be or how they ought to be and you start acting on that and you may not be seeing things the way they are and that's why i think that's a really really important part of leadership and, and you know what and, and i think that's um everything so far you have mentioned it, it's 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 very important for the audience to listen carefully um, because again, we can have a career, even in by all means, I, I, I always say this, uh, even before I, you know, I, I, I went to higher education, I really felt that I had what it took to do the work that I, I'm doing now because I had the experience. I got into the field before I even got a degree. <laughs> so I already have taken all these courses 
to you know improve myself and to be able to be a good asset to other firms working for them before I went on my own, right? So I think it's important that when we talk about foundation, it, for me exactly, you don't have to have a degree. That's just my philosophy. Um, the greatest inventors, the greatest millionaires, even right now, you know, uh, on the face and the surface of this earth, some of them do not even have an associate degree and they've done phenomenal. And then it makes you wonder why is it some people so successful in such great leaders and they have such a clear vision to do the right things as we call them doing the right things, not doing the wrong ones. Right. They get Steve jobs. Didn't Steve jobs. Didn't finish college. Bill Gates didn't finish college. And Microsoft and Apple are huge. Bright, smart, I mean, bright brains, I call them, right? I mean, yeah. they're just phenomenal, genius people. And I mean, that blows your mind just to think that sometimes, you know, the foundation is important, don't get me wrong, but I think there's something, there's certain habits that we have to have in place and we must practice them daily to make them into a routine. The same way I drink my coffee every morning, which I see myself doing until the end of my lifetime, is the same way we need to practice these type of habits because they have to become part of our life daily in a routine. But you have to have, exactly. And the reason I wrote this book and, and put these things in the foundation was so that if you see them and you say, hey, my, my foundation is, am I seeing things the way they are? Am I doing the right things in spite of what it might cost me? Am I willing to work on my skills uh, my knowledge and my skills and work on them to get better. Those are the three things you have to say. So when you, when you find yourself in a situation, you first thing you do is you say, is my foundation okay? If it is, then I can move forward to the next level. And that was where the next level comes in, which is if you're going to be a leader, you're going to have challenges. Uh, somebody once said, if there were no problems in the world, none of us would have jobs. Very true. Very true. So, very true. I like that. So when you look at when you look at the challenges that you're going to face, they come in three types. Okay. The first one, and the one that most people spend probably ninety percent of their time in, is unmet expectations. Somebody has failed to do what was expected of them. That means you could be you. It could be somebody who's working for you. It could be your boss. It could be somebody else. But there's an unmet expectation, and so the question is. How do you fix that? Well, first you have to know why the expectation didn't get met. And there's only three possible reasons. Somebody didn't know what to do. What to do. They didn't know how to do it. How to do it. Or they didn't want to. I didn't want to. <laughs> okay, that's good. So now here's the thing. If you're a leader, you have to understand something. That the what and the how belong to the leader. The only part that belongs to the follower is the wanna. So when you hear some, when somebody has an expectation that doesn't get missed, what's the first thing you usually hear somebody say? Oh, gee, that's a simple task. How come Jones couldn't do that? So they automatically they jump to wanna. When really they should be as a leader saying, Jones wasn't able to get this job done. I wonder if I made it clear what it was he needed to do. I wonder if he knew how to do it. Did he have the training? Did he have the skill? Did he have the practice? Did he have the tools? Did he have the time? Did he have the facilities and the resources and the material he needed to make it happen? Did he have distractions that were keeping him from getting that job done? So the leader says, I got to make sure that what is clear, and then I got to make sure that the how is there. So that the only reason this job doesn't get done is because Jones didn't want to. If you do that, you're going to be a much more successful leader because now, when you have a problem, when an expectation gets missed and you're meeting with Jones or Smith or whoever is involved, you say, okay, did I not do a good job of explaining what exactly I needed? Yeah. I, use, I, I refer to this as the bring me a rock syndrome. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard this story before, but this is the leader comes up and says, bring me a rock. And the people go running out saying, oh gosh, we got to get a rock for the leader. So they right. run out of the parking lot, they find a rock, they bring it in. And, and the leader goes, this is no good. It's too big. It won't fit in my pocket. And he hands it back. So the people run out of the conference room. They run out in the parking lot and then find, find a smaller rock. They bring the rock back into the leader. And the leader says, oh, this is, this is, this is, this, this won't work at all. It's got too many sharp edges and I can't throw it and it's ugly. 
So they run out and say, well, what are we going to do now? Well, we, we need something they can throw, and it's, and it's not ugly. Oh, there's a stream over by the parking lot. Let's go find a rock over there. Those are all nice and smooth and shiny. So they go in the stream, they get a small rock, and they bring it into the leader. He goes, well, I can't show this to a client. This is a gray rock. It's ugly. And, 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 and it, this won't work. So then they go running back out to the stream. They start looking for a rock, and they find a little blue rock. It's shaped like a ball. And they bring it in, and the guy says, well, yeah, this is a little bit better, but, you know, I was really looking for a red rock. So they run out, and they can't find any red rocks in the stream. So they grab a can of spray paint, and they spray paint the blue rock red, and they bring it right back. Wait, what is the story? And now the boss says, well, wait a minute. Uh, this rock is round. Uh, it needs to be flat so it fits in my pocket, and I need to be able to skip it across a lake. So they, go out. so they go, oh, how are we going to do that? So one guy says, well, there's a lapidary down the street. We'll take it down there and have him grind it down to make it, you know, flatter and smoother, and that'll be what the boss wants. So they run down the street, and they get the lapidary to smooth the stone out. They bring it back, and it's red, and it's flat, and it's smooth, and you can throw it, and you can put it in your pocket. So they think they're done. And the guy says, oh, no, this won't work. It needs to be translucent. This is just not, this is, just, those are much prettier. The clients will like these better. So then they go down to the lapidary and they said, we can't find a translucent red flat stone that's round that you put in your pocket and skip across water. So now the guy says, okay, well, I think I can find something. So about a week or so later, the lapidary comes back and he has a translucent red stone that's uh, small and round and flat and you put it in your pocket and they take it in. And the boss says, geez, I don't know why you guys took so long to get me what I asked for. I mean, it's just a simple rock. I mean, why are you giving me all these bum prototypes and lousy examples? Oh my God. So that's a perfect example of a boss who isn't explaining what he wants, isn't explaining how he expects it to be done, but then just you bring it to the boss and the boss says, no, this isn't it. Well, when you do that, you have missed expectations, but that's the boss's fault. The boss hasn't described what, the boss hasn't described how, he hasn't described what the needs are, and so the workers are going around like crazy trying to figure out what the boss wants. And well, that's Stephen. Stephen, thank you so much for sharing that story. That that was, I think that hit you know definitely the, the nail on the head because I, I I think that that is so true. Sometimes, uh, I, and I think all of us. I, I mean, I blame myself for it too. A lot of times, by all means, it, it's that you know we have certain expectations of others, and maybe we just haven't been clear enough. And this is what I always tell my you know my clients, and I tell my prospect clients, especially the new clients coming in. And let's have a clear communication to avoid any misunderstandings. Not right. only I put this on writing on my proposal, but I tell them verbally because I want it to be invaded into their brain to understand that there's certain things that, uh, you know, everyone can do and we have limitations to and we need to accept that. And, and I think sincerity, honesty, which is comparable to sincerity work, is something that you need to be very upfront. And that's one thing so important because there's so much problems when there's miscommunication. And that's part of expectations. Like you said, I expect this. Okay, what is exactly? You want to write it down? One to ten. Tell me exactly what you expect out of it. And then if I produce that, I expect you to like it. Thank you. Exactly. Right. And that's, I, that, that's a key part. Of, of leadership that's where the honesty from the foundation comes in to be able to say this is the way it is this is what the situation is this is what I really need and if you're not doing that you're not helping your people so that's why that's so important and that is a probably 90% or more of the things you're going to deal with as a leader is a challenge is okay. making sure that the expectations are clear right and everybody understands what to do and how to do it so they can go off and make it happen that's TV, really big we are reaching almost at the end of the show, but I want to, anything else that you need to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, bring to the show and, and let the audience know how to reach you because this is a book that I want to buy myself because I, 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 I'm always a firm believer of learning from other pros like yourself. And, um, and, and by the way, I want to say, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for serving, you know, country. 
um, I'm always very grateful uh, for everyone who has served a country no matter what, with Air Force, military, Navy, doesn't matter. Thank you so much for doing that for us. Um, I was born here in the States, even though I'm from immigrant parents um, and very proud of being both, to tell you the truth. Um, Absolutely. In my, my nephew, he's in the National Guard and I'm very proud of that, him too. So um, anyone that I can bring you know, to my show, because I think there's something, and we talked about it briefly at, at, at the beginning before we start recording the show, but I wanted to bring up because a lot of times, like I was mentioning to you, we think that, oh, because you come from a military background, you have to have like a solid foundation. And sometimes that's not always the case. Um, it could be, you know, again, about your personality. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, leadership is something you have to learn how to do. No one's born a leader. Leadership is a mastery that you have to accept and seek and try to find out and try to do better uh, in order to help other people achieve what uh, they could, could, could not achieve by themselves. And that's why it's important. There's a, one other thing I want to talk about that's really important in leadership, and it's part of the challenges. And one of the three challenges, the other two challenges are conflicts or ethical conflicts. What do you do when you have an ethical conflict? Well, there's only three choices. You fix it, you accept it, or you leave. All right, but what you can't do is hang around and bitch about it because if you do that, you're cancer to yourself and you're cancer to your organization. Absolutely. I'll just, that's the, the, the quick version of that one. But here, here's the one I want to really get to. Please. What's the opposite of love? Hate. No. Wrong. <laughs> that's my favorite question. Most people say that because love is something you've a deeply held emotion that compels you to act towards somebody else for their benefit. And hate is also a deeply held emotion that compels you to act towards somebody else, but this time for their detriment. Yeah. Well, that doesn't make them opposites. That makes the results different, but it doesn't make the hate is not the opposite of love. Because hate and, and love are both deeply held emotions yeah. that force you to act towards others. Sure. So what's the opposite of a deeply held emotion that compels you to act? Hmm. Compassion? No, no. Compassion is a deeply held emotion that causes you to act. I'll tell you what it is. Despair. Despair, interesting. Because despair is a deeply held emotion, but it prevents you from acting. When you're in despair, you can't act. You can't lead. You can't follow. Despair is the shutdown button on your soul. So one of the key things for leaders in the challenges is to drive despair out of their personal lives and to drive it out of their organization because people can't follow or lead when they're in despair. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. That's, that's, so that's the other thing that needs to be done. And then when you do that, you get to the point where you can lead, you can assist, you can inspire, and you can depend because that's where the real leadership occurs. Now, Stephen, like I said, before we wrap up, where the audience can find your books? Is it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, your website, and I think uh, it's available already? Is that correct? Yes. The, the, the book's available in hardcover, softcover, and an ebook for Kindle or whatever. Uh, you can get it at Amazon. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. Uh, you can... Uh, get more information about uh, my work and stuff that's in the book uh, in, on my website. It's called the power of fleet leadership.com power of three leadership.com. And if you either write the number three or you spell three, it'll still get you to the same place. So power of three leadership.com is my website. And it's got all the information about the paradigm, the picture. And I have several types of lessons from the book and from other things uh, that I've put on there on, on the website to teach you pieces of each one of the parts of the, uh, of the, uh, of the paradigm. So you can look for an inspir there's an inspiration piece on there. There's a, there's a piece about, uh, I don't know if you heard about the university of Maryland football player who died uh, during, during training uh, and a, a big, the coach got fired and the president of the university resigned and, uh, well, where did leadership fail when that particular incident occurred? 
So there are a lot of things like that that I have on the website that come from the book or other places that illustrate examples of how uh, the leadership principles are either being done well or being done poorly. So another one, leadership role. And, 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 and again, just to, as, as we're finishing this, uh, you know, amazing show with you, Stephen. And, and again, I'm so, you know, grateful for you taking the time to be with us. Because again, um, I have a variation of entrepreneurs. A lot of them are more, you know, into e-commerce, real estate, and different types of, you know, uh, industry. But those are the most profound connected with me because it's what my niche is all about, right? Uh, when it comes to accounting and taxes. But um, one of the things is, you already give your website. Um, uh, what is your next uh, projection? What, what are you planning to do after this book? Do you have any other plans? Are you planning to do seminars or maybe webinars or something like that? Have you I'm, I'm, still work, I'm still working on all of that right now. Uh, I want to get involved with teaching, uh, uh, especially younger people, uh, leadership because too many businesses, do. Look, too, many, too many businesses and military and, and other places Look for people who have very good talent. And then once they reach some level of talent, they say, okay, you're now ready to be a supervisor and be a leader of others because you have great talent. Well, that's kind of late <laughs> to trying to be teaching them a new skill. Um, so I'm trying to teach. Uh, I've, I've, I've made some uh, uh, inroads in teaching kids in high school, and I'm looking to do more of it in, at the college and business school uh, areas because I think it's so important that you learn the fundamentals uh, and the principles of leadership so that you can take your skill, take your talent and make the most of it and be able to influence people to be able to do more than just you who can do all yourself. So Excellent. that's where I want to get in the bottom floor. Uh, a friend of mine was once a, a high school principal and he took a job as a, as a, as a middle school principal. And one of his, one of his, uh, one of his uh, cohorts said, why would you want to go to middle school? That's a terrible place. The kids are all crazy. Their hormones are all going nuts. It's just terrible. Why would you want to be a middle school principal? Right. And he said, he said, well, I've been here at high school and I've been fishing dead bodies out of the stream. I decided to go upstream and find out who was throwing them in. Oh, love it. Love it. Love it. That's excellent. What's well, Stephen? Oh. Once again, it's been a pleasure. And again, to all my audience out there, uh, you know, please let's all learn from each other. And again, absolutely. I'm all these episodes because believe it or not it's not sometimes all about age it's about learning golden nuggets from everyone as we go through life we acquire all these good and bad habits uh so please uh let's try to get rid of the bad habits and replace them or as i call them uh you know replace those bad habits with good ones right and, and i think we don't need to go down the list of what good habits are i think as humans we know the good and the bad inside of us right um so i tell people if there's something that is becoming a conflict in your life you feel you haven't got you haven't reached that point in your life where you want it to be more successful maybe you want to lose weight maybe you want to you know uh be in a better relationship it's all about how it's how we change ourselves in our minds and these are very good, profound uh, principle against the foundation challenge and achievement. Stephen, once again, I appreciate your time and I hope we stay in touch. And uh, to all my audience out there, thank you, thank you. And again, until the next episode, and stay in touch, like, share, and subscribe, not only to our YouTube channel, to our podcast, and also our social media. Thank you so much, everyone. And until the next episode, this is Liz Sora, your host. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.